Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, and it's great to be back at UCLA. Um, as Rodrigo mentioned, I did, was spent five years here. Uh, it's so nice to come back to this nice weather um, and escape the muggy weather in North Carolina. Um, so today I'm going to talk about models um, for riots. And this is work in collaboration mainly with Henri Beristicki and Jean-Pierre Nadal, uh, who are in Paris about two years ago Less than two years ago, I spent some time there, and they had data from a 2005 Paris, uh, France riot, uh, which I will show to you today. And they wanted to do some modeling with this data, and so we started sort of working on this project. But since then, a lot of other people have joined the project and you know have brought up ideas. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to also mention the work of uh, some graduate students as I, as I go along. So riots, of course, um, have been a universal means for a population to express their dis discontent towards their government or react toward critical events or political decisions. Uh, they have occurred throughout time, and they have numerous causes. Um, so you know, we can mention just a few. We have uh, the 1977 Egyptian riots, which were due to food shortages. Uh, the civil rights movement uh, was, of course, due to racial tension. Very recently, the Arab Spring, uh, due to political suppression. So, of course, these are very complex events, and people have very different views uh, on, on what they actually represent. So here, I'm just mentioning, uh, oops, um, you know, two quotes, one from David Cameron, the Prime Minister of England, after the 2011 London riots, which I will talk a little bit about uh, later on. And he mentions that this is just criminality, pure and simple, and it has to be confronted and defeated. On the other hand, we have Mar Martin Luther King, who, you know, thinks of riots as the language of the unheard, right? So these are very, very complex systems. And our um, work, basically our aim is not to validate riots or talk about the ethics behind it, but rather to understand the dynamics. Um, and we talk a lot of, uh, with uh, Sebastian Roche, who has written books about riots, and he is adamant about making a difference between riots and revolutions, uh, because you can think of riots as being more short-lived revolutions, uh, are longer lived and actually bring about substantial change. So just a few things that I want to mention because I know that um, it could be a sort of a touchy subject. Um, but riots usually result from a period of social unrest. They can consist of disorganized beha uh, behavior which uh, where people tend to uh, exhibit herd-like behavior, right? Uh, of course, uh, there are arguments against this point uh, in fact, in 2011, the London riots, uh, that was dubbed the Blackberry riots because people actually use their smartphone to organize, right? So even though there's something about the fact that there's a mob and um, you're anonymous that sort of makes it easier for you to get out there and protest, there's some sort of organization. But we're going to think of riots as sort of bursts of social activity, which are initiated by an external fa factor. We'll refer to it as a triggering event. But it's kept alive uh, for some period due to self-excitement. So these are factors within the system. Uh, and then eventually, it experiences some sort of self-relaxation. So just to give you an idea of sort of what I mean by the triggering events, uh, I want to talk about three examples. Um, the one I'm really mostly interested in is, again, as I mentioned, the, the, the 2005 French riots, uh, which is a 45 um, period of civil unrest that spread throughout the country. Uh, it mostly involved the burning of vehicles and uh, buildings. And the triggering event in this case was um, the death of two young men who were being pursued, along with a third by the police, in one of the poorest neighborhoods uh, of the suburbs of, of Paris, they jumped into a power substation and two of them were electrocuted. Uh, of course, there was already political tension. Uh, this is one of the poorest neighborhoods, high unemployment. Uh, a lot of minorities live there. 
uh, and there's a lot of tension in France. And so clearly, it was this was just sort of uh, something that was needed to initiate um, sort of the riots. And of course, the consequences, you know, are huge. Uh, nine thousand, almost nine thousand vehicles were burned. Um, Two hundred million euros in monetary values uh, were damaged. And of course, more recently, uh, we have, you know, heard in the news the the protest in Ferguson, which was basically initiated by the shooting of Michael Brown by a white police officer. Um, and of course, it sparked a conversation about the relationship between the police and, and the community. And indeed, after investigations, uh, it was concluded that there was a tension, right, uh, between the police and the African-American community. So there's definitely this social tension that we cannot forget when we're trying to model these uh, complex uh, phenomena. And then finally, let me mention uh, the 2011 London riots. Um, this was a short-lived riot, but never, nevertheless very intense, again caused by the shooting of, a, uh, of Mark Dugan by a police officer, uh, and you know, over 250 million pounds in property uh, damages and ov over 3,000 uh, arrests, so it's pretty significant. Uh, so what we see here, or one of the things we see here, is this exogenous, endogenous dichotomy. Um, and of course, this has been observed in many, many systems, right? Worldwide web searches, earthquakes, the number of times a YouTube video is watched, and it has been modeled. Um, I like an example, uh, notice, uh, sort of uh, differentiating sort of exogenous driven versus endogenous driven, uh, which was, uh, discussed in a paper by Sornet, um, and I forget the other author. Um, but basically, they mention that sort of you can think of the endogenous driven phenomena or outbursts of social activity as sort of like the number of views that Harry Potter, the Harry Potter trailer has, where basically you watch it, you like it, you send it to your friends, and so you see a steady increase and then sort of a, a slow decay versus an exogenous driven um, outburst is something like sort of the number of times the word tsunami was actually searched after the 2011 uh, tsunami, right? It was the event happened, everybody went online and searched, and then a few days later, we had forgotten about it. So in terms of um, riots, let's focus, talk a little bit about what I mean by the exogenous factors. As I mentioned, we have the triggering events, uh, which actually then you can see the initiation of the riots, but there are events that happened previously that could potentially increase tension, right, that are sort of uh, important even though we don't see immediate uh, riots happening afterwards, such as sort of uh, the 1992, uh, I guess the beating of, of Rodney King was in 1991, we didn't see any riots happening right after. It was a year later, right, the, the, after the exoneration of the police officers that we saw the first riot. But nevertheless, this wouldn't have happened if the tension hadn't increased. Um, the Egyptian riots wouldn't have happened if uh, there hadn't been high unemployment and poverty uh, when the government decided to get rid of the food subsidies. Um, and then afterwards, of course, we have events that can rekindle the fire, right? A second shooting, which we saw in Ferguson, which again clearly initiated protest again. So these are sort of what I mean by external events uh, that increase tension. The endogenous factors are more word of mouth factors, strengthening in numbers. Like I said, if you think that you're not visible, you, people see the mob, but not you know you personally, you're more likely to get get out there and and protest and riot. Um, so, of course, there are many things that we can think about. Um, so, you know, why are there similar events that in nature that don't cause riots, right? Uh, why did the 1992 LA riots begin after the acquittance of the police officers uh, and not immediately after the beating of King? Um, you know, why do some riots last longer? How do they spread? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, what is clear is that we have to go beyond, of course, the exogenous, endogenous dichotomy is important, but we have to go beyond that um, to be able to capture the complexity. So, again, just to recap the things that we want to capture in our model, we, 
in order for a burst of social activity of this type to occur, the system needs to be ripe, right? Um, and then this is going to lead to self-excitation due to a trigger that initi is initiated by the triggering event uh, and then a period of, of self-relaxation. But we can't forget about globalization of information. Um, there's certainly communication networks have grown. Uh, people now organize with social media, and so it is really important to include space um, and diffusion in these types of models. In fact, uh, preliminary analysis of the 2011 London riots has shown um, the clustering and spatial diffusion of rioting activity. Uh, so let me just show you the uh, events, sort of these, uh, I might have to, this always does this. I tell it to trust it always and it doesn't listen. There we go. So what you see here, so this is France and everything starts in Paris and the bigger the circle, the more the activity. But you can see clear, like clearly how much it spreads throughout the country, right? So that's sort of the self-excitation that we're seeing. And now we're pretty much in the self-relaxation, right? Things are sort of dying down. So it takes pretty much now, it'll take a few seconds, but nothing very excited that's going to happen. But it's clear that we need to include space um, in some way in, in our models. OK. And just sort of uh, for you to see, uh, you have the number of rights in the entire country here on the right. And so you see clearly the sort of self-excitement and then the self-relaxation, OK? Um, so again, we want to develop a model that includes all of these factors. And later on, uh, you know, ideally we want to extract something about the triggering events. Um, we want to say something about the ripeness of the system uh, and talk about what the differences between endogenous and exogenous driven riots, for example. Uh, I should, before I, I discuss our model, I should mention that people have, you know, looked and studied uh, these types of systems before. Uh, so let me just give you, uh, talk about three different uh, works. Uh, one recently introduced a differential equation looking at uh, censorship in, in different states and just doing a you know, steady state stability analysis looked at where riots or where revolutions could actually occur depending on the censorship. People have used uh, network models to look at uh, global civil unrest, looking both at local and, and global links. Um, there has been a lot of analysis done for the 2011 London riots, introducing police strategies and, and so on and so forth. But our perspective is going to be more from a continuum model. Uh, this has sort of become a little trendy within the past decade. Uh, where people have used continuum systems to gain insight because we can actually look at these systems rigorously and uh, you know, prove uh, rigorous mathematical results, look at sp spreading speeds and, and so on and so forth um, to gain some insight into these complex systems. So just, I mean, I, you don't have to really think too much about these equations, but for those of you guys who work on, on partial differential equations, these are sort of the types of systems that arise. Uh, and so the group here at UCLA introduced the, the top model uh, to look and under, to understand the um, spatial temporal dynamics of urban crime. Okay? So we basically uh, follow this trend, uh, mostly because I work on PDEs and my colleagues work on PDEs as well. Um, and again, like I said, you can actually rigorously prove things uh, that you cannot when you look at discrete systems. Okay, so now going to our model, we are going to start with a network of n models, uh, you can, or of, of n nodes, which are regions where, uh, that are susceptible to riots and protests and so on and so forth. The nodes, of course, are connected geographically, but also there could be social connections. 
Uh, as an aside, one of the most interesting questions is what are these social networks, right? So given a riot, can we extract sort of the social networks? Uh, we cannot answer this question yet, but it would be very nice if, if, if we could. Um, so lambda of ST represents the level of rioting activity at each node, okay? Uh, so if the number of events happens to follow a non-homogeneous non Poisson process, then the total number of events uh, is given by the integral here of the conditional intensity, right? So lambda really in this case would represent the conditional intensity, uh, and so this would tell you the expected numbers, okay? Of course, uh, the level of rioting activity is gonna have a dynamic part and a base part. Um, in fact, in France, the burning of cars has become sort of a natural, uh, a, a national hobby. They're constantly, like people are constantly burning cars, and so of course they're, that would be part of this sort of base rate. We care about the dynamics, right? The dy dynamic part. So the reinforcement, right, the self-excitement uh, is going to be modeled in the dynamics of, of lambda. And so here what you see is omega gives you the amount that the intensity decays per unit of time, the natural decay. And the endogenous effect uh, is given by this function g of c, which is sort of kpp, right, like. So it's positive in some region, right, this is sort of a carrying capacity, and then zero in two places, and then a negative for z bigger than zero, and also zero, um, negative for c less than or equal to zero. So of course, but riots occur only if the system's ready, right? So somehow, um, we need to include tension, right? So we introduce sort of a potential field, uh, which measures the stress of the system, and we denote it by alpha. So you can think of, so now we introduce this multiplicative term, uh, where R could be this sigmoid function. So A is what I call the critical threshold value. So if, if lambda is above A, this is close to one, right? So turning on the endogenous factors. If it's less than A, this is close to zero, turning off the endogenous factors, okay? Beta is sort of a transition slope, right? So as beta approaches infinity, this approaches a step function, right? Uh, as beta approaches zero, you have your slope is, is uh, sort of uh, smaller and smaller, okay? The, so the, tr and, and what I mean by the relaxed state, the relaxed state is when we have no endogenous factors in effect, and the excited state is when we have endogenous factors. So this is sort of analogous to flame propagation where you need the temperature to be sufficiently high before a flame actually starts, right? What about the exogenous factors? Well, the external factors actually increase the tension of the system as makes sense from the different examples that I, I discussed. And we will consider uh, examples where you can trace these events to a single time and place and they're gonna be modeled as source terms, okay? Uh, other external factors, such as the state of the economy, can be included in some uh, sort of constant factor. Really, this should be stochastic, um, but uh, that would certainly be something worth exploring later on. But so here's the model that we have for the tension initially. So here, sort of, if you have n external events, you have a sum of n, uh, source terms uh, which are located at the time of the event, the location of the event. A sub i measures the strength of each of these factors, and then h of lambda describes the effect that lambda has on the decay of the tension. And actually, p is gonna play a significant role, uh, something that we recently realized. Um, we're gonna stick to this case. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about is gonna be the p-positive case. But this sort of really separates uh, two different modeling perspectives, right? So p-positive is sort of a tension enhancement. What I mean by that is that we get a cooperative system. So the increased protest lead to a slower decay of rioting activity. Um, so this is really going to lead to things like traveling wave solutions, as we'll see, which of course then is more appropriate for things that are longer lasting, such as revolutions. Um, on the other hand, if you consider the P less than zero case, this is like an exhibitory 
an uh, inhibitory system, excitatory inhibitory system, where the tension turns on the endogenous factors, but then the number of proteins actually inhibits the tension. Uh, so you can think of this as short outbursts of activity that then sort of drains energy. Uh, this is analogous to neural field models. And what's going to come out of this type of models are going to be, instead of traveling waves, traveling pulses, which are really more appropriate for situations such as the London riots, where what you observed is people were looting, they're going to businesses, breaking windows, and so there are so many things that you can loot, and then you have to move to a different location, right? So certainly, this is more appropriate for those type of ca cases, whereas this is more appropriate for sort of more substantial types of protest and, and revolutions. So for the most part, I'm just going to focus on the P-positive case, although I will show some simulations for, for the P-negative case. So here's sort of our single, uh, single node model, right? I haven't introduced space at all yet. Uh, we're really combining an explicit field that is measurable and an implicit field that can't be measured, right? So you can think of it as a potential field. Um, and of course, this comes with initial conditions. At this point, we don't have any boundaries. Uh, and that's also a difficult question. Well, what are the initial conditions, right? So there's certainly a lot of questions that are difficult um, from the modeling perspective. But if we just do some simple single node simulations, if you look at the decay that we observe here, this is sort of a slower decay, more of what was observed in the French riots. I didn't show you the data for the 2011 riots, but you have something like within five days, a high increase, and then all of a sudden, nothing. So you have there a, a fast self-relaxation. Here we have two triggering events, right? So this is sort of like the 1992 LA riots where the tension increases not high enough, right? And it begins to increase. And even if the second event is uh, you know, not as intense, it's sufficient to bump the tension above the critical threshold so that your riot uh, then starts. And then here, sort of, sort of uh, double peak, right, where there was a second event, and so it reignited more like what we saw in Ferguson, Missouri, OK? So just sort of some, uh, we're able to reproduce uh, riots that we have actually um, observed in real life, okay? Of course, we want these bursts to eventually die, right? They don't last forever, so, uh, you know, just some simple propositions for the single node case. Um, under a certain parameter regime, and this is what I mean, our, uh, our parameters have to satisfy this and our functions have to satisfy this, then if lambda's uh, initially positive, eventually there's going to be, they're both going to decay to zero, okay? But on the other hand, yes, sir? Uh, we do have the rate I did not, I, I did not include it, but it's going to be exponential, yeah. Um, now, you can also include, like if you can make these uh, last as long as you want, right? So. If you give me a certain length and time and a little delta, there's going to be a strong enough event or triggering event that's going to allow for your rioting activity to stay above the maximum level of crit critical activity or at least within delta from that maximum level, right? So, you know, the, the higher the, which is sort of natural, right? The higher the intensity, the stronger the intensity, the longer that they're, they're going to last. Okay, um, in reality, uh, there are shocks which occur on a regular basis, right? Affecting the tension in non-obvious ways. Uh, this really should be stochastic, but as a um, first step to try to explore how they affect the dynamics and how long they last, you can look also at periodic exogenous events. Uh, so for example, you can take this, this source term um, which is just, you know, you have a triggering event happening, uh, happening with period T and intensity A, and you can try to explore what happens there, just again on, this, on, the, on the single node. If your, if your frequency is, is low enough, you're gonna have this overdamping effect where you have activity that is oscillating but is rapidly decreasing, 
if you have medium frequency, you end up with this limit cycle, right? So you converge to a limit cycle. Um, and we can actually prove the existence of these limit cycles and their stability. And in fact, you have multiple. Uh, I sh this is something that we're still writing up, but you have, uh, in, in, in some regimes, you have multiple uh, positive uh, limit cycles. And if you have a higher frequency, so here's also, it's hard to see, but there's a limit cycle here, sort of a zoom. You have limit cycles that are closer and closer to the maximum uh, level of activity. Um, so that's basically, uh, you know, just on a single node, but of course we have a network, right? And we need to incorporate uh, the, these types of connections. So we want to include both global and social connections. Um, and we can look at that by um, introducing matrices, right, that define the geographic connections and the social connections, right? So it's simple. If node i and j are neighbors, there's going to be a 1 for vij and 0 otherwise. And you do the same thing for the social connections. Um, if there's some sort of communication, uh, this actually does not have to be symmetric, right? You can imagine that Paris influences the rest of the country, whereas maybe urban centers are not really going to influence Paris. Um, you can nicely introduce the geographic um, proximity by introducing this either graph Laplacian or discrete Laplacian if, if you're on a grid. Uh, and then this one's a little bit more complicated, so we just write it as a sum. But again, uh, because we want to be able to prove things about this model, we look at the limit as the number of these nodes goes to infinity, and the distance between the nodes goes to zero. Okay? And so we, we obtain this system of reaction diffusion equations. And in this case, if we assume that the geographic connections are the same as the social connections, we end up with a local system. Okay? That's not necessarily going to be the, the case in general. In fact, it's not going to be the case in general. Um, but let's first analyze that. Again, we want to make sure that there's eventual self-relaxation. And if you assume that the parameters satisfy this, uh, then we have uh, that the L1 norm of the tension is going to, in fact, decrease. And, Here's decay, and here's sort of uh, a, an upper bound. But we also have a lower bound, right? So we, I know, we know exactly, or we have an idea of how these triggering events are actually affecting the decay of the tension. Um, on top of that, if you give me an epsilon, I can give you a time where I know that the mass of the level of writing activity is going to be bounded above by that epsilon, OK? So in fact, we have decay of this. Um, of the L1 norms. Okay. Now, we can think of the spread of rioting activity as a front which moves where the high level, uh, where, where the high level of activity is invading regions uh, where there's no activity or there's the base level of activity. And so it's natural to look for, to see if our system supports traveling wave solutions. Um, to do that, of course, we want to find the steady states the null line for uh, alpha gives me this, and then I can just substitute it into uh, my function here. And I get that I have two steady state solutions, one ex uh, which we'll call the excited state, where there's actually a high level of activity, and the non-excited, which is no or the base level of activity. And with the parameter regimes that we chose, the excited state the non-excited is, oh, sorry, the excited is always going to be unstable, okay? Uh, stable. Uh, the excited state is always stable. The non-excited state, depending on the value of the critical threshold, is going to separate it into a bistable, so you have two stable, constant, I'm only looking at constant steady state solutions, or a monostable. And so, in fact, uh, if we look for these uh, traveling wave solutions, right, so they're solutions where now we're in this moving frame. We substitute it back into our system. Here's the new system. So here's sort of the high level of activity. Here's the base level of activity. Um, we indeed have uh, traveling wave solutions. And the interesting thing is, is that we have two regimes. Uh, 
So here's where the criticality comes in, and the criticality comes in multiple times throughout this talk and this work, uh, is that if your critical tension is abo it's above this critical value, uh, there exists a unique uh, traveling wave and a unique speed, which is positive, right? Um, but if A is below this critical value, then you have traveling wave solutions, but the speed is not necessarily unique, right? So what that implies is that for a given value of A, um, if uh, for large values of A, there's a unique way in which the riots are gonna spread, but for small values of A, they're gonna spread depending on the initial condition, right? So you can have initial conditions that are gonna lead to faster and faster and faster invasions, right? So that's sort of a key difference between um, it, it, in that the value of A gives. Okay, of course, in the data, we don't see, I mean, traveling wave solutions, right? But what we do see are traveling wave-like solutions. Um, so here, it's difficult, so I've extracted some of the data, and it's difficult to see what I'm talking about, but let me try to explain. So Department 93 is where Paris is, and that's sort of the blue. And so here the, is a number of events per day. You can see that the peak is the highest and it occurs first. This one's the closest department. That's the second highest peak and then it occurs next. Uh, and so in general, it's not always true, you see this trend that as you've moved further and further away, the peak occurs uh, sort of, uh, the, the peak decreases and then uh, it happens later in time. And so that's what I mean by traveling wave-like solutions, because these are really not traveling waves, right? But our model actually, under some parameter regimes, actually is able to reproduce these types of traveling wave-like solutions, where here the shock occurred at x is equal to zero, and so here sort of the level of activity, it's the highest, and then this is the second highest, third highest, and so on and so forth. Here sort of another, another example. Uh, so here the shock, you can't even see it, but it, it occurred at zero, not at five. So it actually is able to reproduce this general, I mean, again, this is a very complex system. It's not exactly how things are spreading, but generally we do observe this, this trend. Okay, now the social tension is gonna spread differently than the, you know, it's not gonna be geographic, right? We know what happens all over the world, and so we're we can react to that. So really, the tension should be uh, modeled by a non-local operator, and you can actually uh, end up with uh, this integral operator. Uh, I didn't show you the details, but it's a you know, typical derivation. And you can think of J, it's a kernel, and it depends on two different locations. Um, basically, J of X, Y measures the influence that Y has on X, right? So you can think of this as providing the domain of and the strength of the influence of location X, and this here provides the range and the strength of the influence. And of course, this is gonna determine how the information spreads and how it happens, right? Um, so here, remember where we had that sum when I first started talking about nodes, if you take the limit, you end up with this uh, non-local operator, okay? So the first thing to do is make sure that we actually have solutions. Uh, so in fact, we can prove that we have uh, global solutions to the Cauchy problem provided, uh, well, D can be bigger than or equal to zero, uh, provided there, our kernel satisfies this condition here, right? So we have unique, positive, and global solutions in time that uh, are bounded and continuous, okay? So one of the things that we're interested in is looking at traveling wave solutions, the existence of traveling wave solutions for these non-local, local, non-local non system, something that we're currently working on. But just to show you sort of an interesting simulation that came out of this, um, if you, I, we wanted to understand the effect of the strength of the triggering event and here I take a small triggering event, and what happens, so here the triggering event happens here, as you can see, it does not spread, right? There's absolutely no spread. 
Well, okay, there's a little bit of spray. You can barely see it. There's just a little bit and then it dies. If A is a little bit bigger, you begin to see a local spread. So somehow the local operator is, in this regime, is stronger. As A increases, you begin, or, or the level of rioting, rioting activity actually spreads non-locally. Uh, and so in this regime, the non-local operator seems to uh, have a stronger influence than the local operator. Uh, it is definitely uh, not easy to prove that this, this critical phenomena, but it's something that we would love to be able to prove rigorously whether there exists a critical A star where you go from this regime to this regime and another one from this regime to this regime. Uh, but, you know, just sort of, um, it's something that we weren't expected, expecting and um, it's quite interesting. So now let me, let me talk about, uh, there are a lot of other things that we have done, but let me just mention uh, the P less than zero case because uh, we sort of recently became interested in this case. Um, let me just show you a few simulations uh, for, for this case where we have basically a delta function, right? So we have a shock that occurs here in the middle and hopefully I won't have to trust the document again. And so what we see here instead of traveling wave solutions is these traveling pulses, right? So again, instead, again, uh, there is some level of activity, but um, it's like what happened in the 2011 riots, right? It's like there's not enough, there, there are no longer things to, to uh, vandalize here, so you move, right? So the wave moves as a pulse and not as a traveling wave solution. Uh, so again, representing the, the need to move from location to location. And this is again exactly what was observed in the 2011 riots. Uh, so this is the appropriate case to model that type of, of event. Uh, let's see. Somehow my computer's stuck. Doesn't want to keep going. Okay, so here's what happens with the same parameters except with P positive. And you should expect this because this is, we've seen that this is a regime where we have traveling wave solutions, right? So again, here we have the maximum level of activity. And so this again, representing a more substantial activity, right? So it's, it's not about looting, it's about being, you know, you have the same amount of people going out there, uh, sort of representing more revolutions and protests, right? But there's really a clear difference between these two regimes. Uh, not only from the mo modeling perspective, from the mathematical perspective, right? In this case, um, in the P less than zero case, we don't have a cooperative system, right? So things are sort of, um, hard, the, the, the theory is harder there. So let me just uh, show you fits for the data where we don't have space. We're currently working on including space. Uh, to see if we can actually reproduce, somewhat reproduce. It's going to be hard with a continuous model. Uh, really, the appropriate model should be a network. Um, but reproduce some of the behavior that we observe in terms of the spreading. But just to give you an idea of the fit for uh, looking at sort of the total events that ha happen in the country, uh, here's sort of what a linear model gives you. It's not that bad. I mean, we just sort of, we didn't include um, some of the, of the nonlinearities, and you know, the model's still pretty good. If you look at the, but let me just show you, right? So it definitely, it's not perfect. It certainly doesn't get the maximum value. Uh, it doesn't capture completely the, the decay. If we introduce, if we look at the completely nonlinear model, uh, you end up with being able to capture the maximum a little bit better. You still, you're, you're never gonna be able to capture this maximum value. Uh, with at least with uh, reaction diffusion models, but it gets the tail down uh, much much nicer. Okay, the London riots uh, it does not capture them quite as nicely, uh, and I don't know if it's MATLAB because it, you have to give it the right initial uh, point to start, otherwise it doesn't complain. Um, but certainly the, the non-local model does much better than the, sorry, the linear model does, the non-linear model does much better than, than the non-linear. Um, so let me just sort of conclude with uh, 
discussing general applicability of this model. So we were motivated by riots, but this could also model conflict of various natures, uh, loss of confidence among people. Of course, you have to think about what the reaction terms are, and I think here more of a bistable term uh, would be appropriate. Um, we've started working at looking at censorship and heterogeneous environments, and this leads to periodic solutions in pulsating traveling waves. So we're looking at the existence of these traveling wave solutions, which we can see numerically, uh, but understanding really how the parameters play a role in that. Uh, and I mentioned earlier with uh, Henri Barosicki and Luca Rossi, we're looking at the existence and stability of limit cycles. Uh, that's basically being written up right now. And sort of future avenues of research and things that some graduate students are working on are the existence of traveling wave solutions for the non-local system, uh, proving the existence of the double critical threshold phenomena, I think, would be extremely interesting. Uh, and then generally looking into how the heterogeneous um, environments uh, affect the survival of rioting activity. Um, so with that, let me thank you for your time. Thank you.